We are here in Psalm 56, so if you're not there, turn with me at this time to that place. Now, Psalm 56 was written when David was seeking refuge in the Philistine city of Gath. You see, David was not yet king. Saul, as you recall, was out to do him in. Saul, who was king of the nation, was threatened by him. And Saul was chasing him down, trying to wipe him out. And David made his way to the Philistine city of Gath, where Achish was king. He sought refuge in that place. Well, as you recall, the men of that city of Gath came to Achish, the king, and said, Do you know who's come to town? Do you know who's in our city? David, the one about whom they sing there in Israel. They sing, Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain ten thousand. David, their champion, David, who killed our hero, Goliath, who came from the city of Gath, you see. And David realized at that time that he was discovered, that the word was out, that people on the street were talking about him. And he realized that he was in danger, that he was in trouble. Now, I don't know exactly what David was thinking, how he could go into Gath. Obviously, he wasn't a Philistine. And besides that, in the verses preceding this incident, David, you see, in fleeing from Saul, went to Nob. And there Ahimelech, the high priest, gave to David for a weapon the sword of Goliath. You see, it had been in Ahimelech's possession as the priest, and now he turned it over to David. So David has Goliath's sword when he rides into town, into Gath. And that was, of course, Goliath's home city. I don't know what David was thinking. I mean, here he is, <laughs> carrying Goliath's sword. It must have been huge, you see. And, and I don't know if he thought he wouldn't be discovered, but he was, and now he knows he's in danger. Ultimately, he will escape by feigning to be mad, spittle running down his beard and clawing at the gates of the city. They will report, David's gone crazy. There's a madman. And Achish the king will say, do I need another insane person in this city? Open the gates and let him out, you see. And that is what was taking place when David penned this psalm. He's in Gath. He realizes that he's in danger. It's always that way when we seek refuge in the places of the world, in Gath. David cries out at that time, Oh, be merciful unto me, O God. For man would swallow me up. He fighting daily oppresseth me. Mine enemies would daily swallow me up. For they be many that fight against me, O Thou Most High. What time I am afraid, I will trust in Thee. In God I will praise His word. In God I have put my trust, and I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Every day they rest my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather themselves together. They hide themselves. They mark my steps when they wait for my soul. Shall they escape by iniquity? In thine anger cast down the people, O God. For thou tellest, verse 8, my wanderings. Put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? And here David is declaring, Lord, you know what I'm dealing with. You know what I'm going through. Be merciful to me, Lord. You know my wanderings. And so too we can say, Lord, you know our wanderings as well. How sometimes we miss the mark. Sometimes we get off track. 
Sometimes we find ourselves acting crazy like a madman in Gath. But here David understands that his God is his Father. You understand. You feel for me. He says here, Are not my tears in a bottle written in a book? That is, you record the things I'm dealing with. You record the things I'm crying about. You record the things I'm working through. Now, Malachi makes mention of a book of remembrance. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 16, we are told that they that feared the Lord spoke often one to another. People like you and me that fear the Lord, that respect Him, that love Him, talking about the Lord one to another. It says, and the Lord hearkened. And the word hearkened there is a Hebrew word which speaks of, well, when a dog perks up his ears when he hears the call of his master or the whistle of his owner. How a dog perks up his ears. That's the idea. And we are told that God, our Father, his ears, if you would, perk up when he hears his children, you and me, talking to each other about him. It says that God hears, he hearkens, and he writes it, we are told in Malachi 3.16, in a book of remembrance. That is, God evidently, if you would, keeps a scrapbook of sorts. And when you talk to somebody, when you talk with somebody about him, he listens in and he writes it down and he puts it in his scrapbook, if you would. Now my wife, Tambo, Tammy, she has these scrapbooks. We have about 104 right now in our house, it's true. And they record everything. They record our kids from the earliest of days all the way to the present time. All sorts of pictures that she's taken. She's an outstanding photographer. And the pictures she's taken and little mementos and, and notes that they've written, cards they've given to us, things that are pleasant and, and things that are, well, like I was looking the other day at, I think it was number 43. And uh, these scrapbooks are great, I'll tell you. By the way, if a fire ever broke out in our house, that would be the first thing I would grab, those scrapbooks. Well, I'd get my kids first if they were in the house. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but I'll tell you, after I got my kids, I would get those scrapbooks because the memories, and in one of the books I was looking at the other day, there was a note that we saved from Mary Elizabeth, my daughter. And this note was written when Mary was in second grade. And it's a piece of paper written in a second grader's printing. Dear Mommy, I run away, she said. I'm at Rachel's house. <laughs> it's true. Rachel lived right across the street. I'm at Rachel's house, and then she gave the phone number, 899-8734. I love you, Mommy. Sign Mary. Now, Mary on that day evidently had some sort of problem, and she wandered off across the street seeking refuge and exile at Rachel Baker's house, you see. <laughs> But you know, she's my daughter. She's our daughter. We love her so much, and even though she was wandering off we knew where she was, she told us. And she came back in about 20 minutes. And the thing is, that note we put in the scrapbook, because you see, her heart, her heart, her heart is so right. She's such a lovely girl. And we love her, and she loves us, and we're so grateful for her. Father is like that. You know, sometimes we think, oh no, what have I done? But you know, our Father looks at it a little bit differently, I'm convinced. He knows. And here David, when he's at a place where he probably really shouldn't be, yet, yet his heart is still towards his father. And the father knows that. And David says, oh, you record even the tears that I shed, the situation that I'm in. Lord, it's recorded by you and written in a book of remembrance. 
I'm, I'm convinced that we're going to be blown away on that day when we're in heaven about how much our Father loved us, even through the gaffy times, if you would. He cares about you. He's in love with us. And David here says, Oh, Lord, you know the tears that I've shed. Lord, these things are written in your book, and indeed, they are and will be. You know my wanderings. Put thou my tears into the bottle. Are they not in thy book? When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me. Hey, if you don't underline any other thing in your Bible tonight or make note of any other portion, please remember that. David said, even in Gath, God is for me. Oh, this is crazy, David might say. I'm under pressure and I'm acting like a madman. It's true. But, but this I know, that God is for me. And guess what? God is for me and you too. If God be for us, who can be against us? And God demonstrated, we are told, by the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans, God demonstrated or proved His love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When did He demonstrate irrefutably that He was for you and for me? Well, when we were sinners. Not at church, not trying hard, not walking with Him, but when we were at our worst place. That's when God said, by His mercy and grace, I love you. I choose you to be part of my family. I choose you, the Lord would say, to be my bride for all of eternity. God is for us, even in Gath, you see. And David here knew that fact. He was a man after God's own heart. He, he knew something about the heart of the Lord. And David here would declare, I know that God is for me. In God will I praise His word. In the Lord will I praise His word. In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. Thy vows, verse 12, are upon me, O God. I will render praises unto thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death. Wilt not thou deliver my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living? God, you have rescued me from death previously. Will you not rescue me in this place presently? God rescued you and me from eternal death. I know He's going to see us through and do what's best for me and best for you in this present life. You see, there in Romans 8 that I alluded to, listen while I read to you. What shall we say then? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Romans 8, 31 and 32. If God spared not his son to rescue you, to rescue me from eternal death, then you got to know that he's going to give us whatever we have need of presently, that he's going to see us through. I've got great news for you. God is not mad at you. He's not down on us. But rather, He's for you. He's for me. He's for us. He proved it on the cross of Calvary. Yeah. He's going to see us through. Being confident of this very thing, that He who hath begun a good work in you shall be faithful to complete it. Guarantee. David knew that even in that city the Philistine city of Gath. Well, in Psalm 57, this psalm, as we saw this morning, as Pastor Chuck gave a grand teaching once again, deals with 
the mercy of God. David, of course, at this time is, again, fleeing from Saul. He's in a cave there at En Gedi, down by the Dead Sea. And he's in this cave, hiding away, when, lo and behold, guess who comes in the same cave? Coincidentally. <laughs> hey, it was Saul himself. Saul, who had 3,000 men with him, made their way into the same cave, not knowing that David was already there. And Saul was taking a nap, and David, David was told by his men, this is your opportunity. Man, do him in, wipe him out, lop off his head. But David would not do that. Instead, he just took a piece of cloth off the skirt that Saul was wearing. More than likely the hem of the garment, which would speak of Saul's pedigree, his position. For you see, in Bible days, in those times, they would actually, on the hem of their garments, tie strings into knots in such a way that you could read those knots and understand where a man was from, what family, what tribe, what his position might be. And so when David cut the garment of Saul, no doubt it was that part of Saul's garment, in a sense cutting off that which spoke of, of Saul's position, his authority. He cut it off. Then we are told his heart smote him. He, he felt terrible about that. Well, Saul would awaken, make his way out of the cave, and then David called out after him, Saul, Saul, look what I have, and showed him the material in his hand that came from Saul's garment, obviously. In so doing, David was showing, Saul, I could have killed you, but I didn't. Saul, I'm not out to get you, like they're saying. David knew that he must not touch the Lord's anointed, as David himself declared. Saul, the anointed instrument in God's hand to make David into the kind of man that God wanted David to be. Maybe there's somebody even presently who's chasing you down, hurling spears in your direction, trying to wipe you out, treating you unfairly, cruelly, unkindly. Here's what I, here's what you, here's what we need to remember. Such a person is anointed, huh? Anointed by the Lord. What? Anointed by the Lord to work the Lord's purposes in your life, in my life, to make us into the men, into the women that God desires for us to be, that we might rule for the Lord, reign with the Lord much more effectively. And so if I lop off their heads, so to speak, retaliate, throw spears back. Hey, I'm missing what God is doing in my life. That person, my boss, my husband, well, not my husband, but I mean, whoever it might be, nor my boss, by the way. But whatever the situation might be where there might be somebody in a position that's over you or linked to you, and you think, my goodness, this person, they've got to go. But wait, the Lord knows. The Lord understands. The Lord will remove that Saul in due season. But in the meantime, that person, that situation could be the very instrument that God is using to make you into a better person than you otherwise would be. Well, David, David didn't lop off Saul's head David showed mercy to Saul, and he understood that Saul was the anointed man, the anointed instrument in God's hand. Even though David had been anointed to be king by Samuel, yet David understood, no, Saul still has the anointing. Particularly, specifically, I believe, David would say, to work on me. I must not touch that. Be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee, yea, 
In the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. I will cry unto God most high, unto God that performeth all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. And then the word Selah, which means think about that. David knew that he didn't do the best when he clipped the garment of Saul. We are told his heart smote him. But here David says, be merciful to me. He asks the Lord to be merciful to him. You know what? He can make this request with confidence because, well, David himself showed mercy. David himself expressed mercy. David himself demonstrated mercy when he didn't lop off Saul's head having the opportunity. Now Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall what? Obtain mercy. David can pray and say confidently, Have mercy on me. For David, indeed, he did show mercy. In Luke chapter 6, and again, I'll, I'll read it to you, But Jesus talks about this whole issue of mercy, the importance of it, the necessity for it, when he says this, Love your enemies, Luke chapter 6, verse 35, do good. Lend, hoping for nothing in return. Your reward shall be great, and you shall be children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful, and to the evil. So be ye therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. Hmm. Love your enemies. Do good. Lend, give. Be kind. Be merciful, our Lord said to us. Because, he says, your Father is merciful. So judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Give, it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Now, as I mentioned before, verse 38 Given it shall be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. We often hear that verse used by preachers or televangelists in the context of giving. That is, giving money, telethons or pledges or whatever it might be. This verse isn't talking about giving money, it's talking about giving mercy. It's talking about showing mercy, being merciful, giving mercy. And it says, Jesus declares, here's the principle. If you give out mercy, if you show yourself to be merciful, men will be merciful to you when you have need of mercy. And folks, you and me, we are all in need of mercy. We all drop the ball. We all fall short. And God has been merciful to us. It's true. But we need mercy from each other, too. And who receives mercy? I'll tell you who receives mercy. The one who is merciful. If you want to receive mercy when you have your hour of difficulty, then be merciful to everybody Show mercy to anybody. Be kind. Yeah, you say, but wait a minute. They're still mean, or they're being unkind still to me. They haven't repented or what have you. So why should I be merciful or forgiving to them? I'll tell you why. Because the Bible says in Ephesians 4, Be ye kind one to another tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Yeah, 
God has forgiven us. In fact, we see God in the flesh on the cross when people are spitting on him, hurling curses at him, making fun of him. God in the flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, and as they do that, what does Jesus say? What does Jesus pray? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He didn't say, Father, forgive them when they repent and realize. He said, forgive them even now because they don't understand. And that's always the way it is. When people are mean-spirited, when they're throwing spears, hurling curses, spitting at you or on me, hey, they don't understand the bigger picture. They don't understand the biblical principles. And we need to be like our Lord. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing, you see. David here can say, be merciful. With expectancy and confidence, inspired by the Spirit recorded in this word for all of us to study, because he himself showed mercy. And he says, Lord, be merciful to me. And he also went on to say, he also declares there in that psalm before you and me, he says, Lord, I know that you will perform all things, verse 2, for me. You shall send from heaven and save me from the reproach of him, Saul, that would swallow me up. Lord, you're going to perform it. You're going to intervene. You're going to solve the problem in due season. Again, I love David's heart here. David realizes, Lord, I need mercy too, and I can expect it from you. I showed mercy to Saul. And Lord, I'm trusting in you to perform all things, to work it out. I realize that it's something that I can't and mustn't try to make happen by lopping off that guy's head. <laughs> That's not what I ought to do. Hmm. God puts me and you in fixes. He puts us in fixes to fix us. Now, so often, too frequently, I try to fix the fix that God put me in. But when I do that, then God has to put me in another fix to fix the fix that he wanted to fix in the first place, you see. <laughs> it's true. God allows these situations or those people to come into my life. It's the anointed instrument to change me. If I try and fix it, you see, in my own strength, in my own energy, then the Lord is going to have to put me in another fix to get that work done in me. David is wise here. Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, I trust in you that you will send from heaven, verse 3, and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. God, verse 3, shall send forth his mercy and his truth. Now my soul is among lions, and I lie even among them that are set on fire. The sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue a sharp sword. Oh, they're out to get me. But be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have digged a pit before me into the midst whereof they are fallen themselves. Now, Saul's chasing me, but hey, he's falling into his own trap ultimately. And he did. In that cave and ultimately on Mount Gilboa as you might recall the story. But my heart, verse 7, is fixed. Oh God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Awake up, my glory. Awake, psaltery and harp. I myself will awake early. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto thee among the nations. My heart is fixed. David here, you see, in that situation... No doubt being chased by Saul day after day, week after week. 
his life, David's life, in danger. His men wondering, why didn't you grab the opportunity and fix it, David? You could have wiped him out. You could have solved your problem. You could have got ahead, literally. <laughs> David, you missed the opportunity. Oh, no. David would say, my, my heart is fixed. My heart is fixed. Sometimes when things are grimly, we can feel depressed. And people sometimes sad to say in the world, I need a fix. A fix of some drug, some narcotic, some pill. Sad to say, sometimes Christians fall into the same situation when they feel as though they're in some kind of cave of despair, despondency. But David said, here's the fix that will really see you through, ultimately praise him. David said, my heart is fixed. I will sing. I will give praise. Wake up, my glory. Awake, psaltery and harp. I myself will awake early. Hey, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to wake up. And I'm going to praise you, Lord. I'm going to worship you. And haven't you found, I've discovered over and over again like you, that man, when you feel as though everything is kind of dark, grimly and blue, man, you start praising the Lord and worshiping Him. And how the atmosphere changes radically. The Lord is enthroned upon the praises of His people. He has given us the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, you see. Praise, worship. That's what David declared in this time of his days of difficulty. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing, verse 9, unto thee among the nations. For thy mercy is great unto the heavens, and thy truth unto the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. I like that song. Be merciful to me. Intervene according to your timing see me through and Lord I know you will and I'm going to praise you by the way sometimes people ask us don't they well I I know I'm not supposed to be bitter at her upset with him but what can I do two simple clues two simple keys that work so effectively Jesus said pray Pray for your enemies. Don't curse them. Who is a person that comes to mind right now that that bugs you? Who are you sort of irritated by, mad at, kind of down on? I dare you to do what Jesus said, even right where you're sitting, right here, right now, tonight, to pray, Lord, bless And then name that person. Just prosper them. Bless them. Guide their steps and bless their lives and draw them to you, Lord, and work wonders within them. Bless them. Bless them. Bless them. And when I pray, as we pray in that way, to bless them and to pray, for our enemies and those that persecute you and me. Hey, something happens. Oh, they may change, Lord willing, and the Lord is willing. But whether they change or not, I change in my feelings towards them, my perspective on them. Because I'm pouring my treasure into them. How? Through prayer. And wherever your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I have found and I discover time and again that when I pray for a person who might be irritating me or a problem for me, when I really pray for him, when I really go into my closet, so to speak, and pray for him, I become sort of interested in them, wondering, now, I wonder what the Lord is doing in light of my praying. And I inquire. And I find myself not going across the street if I see them coming down my side of the street, you see. 
I, I find myself interested, involved, because that's what prayer does. I'm, I'm putting my treasure in them in that way. So in the closet, secondly, and this applies to Wednesday night gang, at the table. When you come, as we come to the Lord's table, as we eat of his body and drink of his blood, would you once again remember, would you reflect on, would you understand, would you be put into remembrance of these things, that that blood and that body that's in your hand, that blood was shed and that body was broken for you, but not just for you. That blood was shed and that body was broken for him, for her, for those that bug you. Jesus is passionately in love with them. He died in place of them. And what you're irritated, what I'm bugged by, yeah, but somebody's got to pay for what they did or what they say. The Lord says, I did when I hung on the tree. And Johnny, are you suggesting that what I did is not sufficient, not adequate? Yeah, but they're really bad. I paid for that. I pay, That cup that you hold, that bread that you eat. Yes, it's for you, but it's for him or for her or for them too, you see. Yes, it's for you, but it's for him or for her or for them too, you see. And if you come to the Lord's table with that mentality, not just for yourself, but saying, Lord, I come with a realization that you shed your blood and your body was ripped apart and you gave your life for, and then put that person's name in the blank. And I thank you for doing that for them. Man, something happens. It's miraculous, it's mystical, it's powerful, it's wonderful. Two things that I've found that are so very practical to do. In the closet, to pray. At the table, to remember, hey, the Lord died for him, for her, for those sins that I'm aware of. He died for that too, you see. David. When Saul ultimately died, it's amazing what happened. David cried. I would think he would have partied. I would think he would say, hip, hip, hooray, man. Saul's dead. But that's not what David said. He wept for Saul. For Jonathan, too. That I can understand, but he wept for Saul and lamented for him. Amazing what happens when we're men, women, after God's heart. Well, Psalm 58. Psalm 58 was probably written when David came into power early on in his administration, and he is aware of the corruption in the political, the judicial system. And most commentators, most of the Jewish commentators, believe that this was written at that time by David when David came into power and realized the corruption that seemed to be everywhere because of the previous administration, Saul's reign. Do ye indeed speak righteousness, O congregation, or literally, to the congregation? Do ye judge uprightly, you sons of men? Are ye judging properly? Is there justice and integrity? Yea, in heart you work wickedness. You weigh the violence of your hands in the earth. That is, you weigh in on the side of violence. The wicked, verse 3, are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Hmm, interesting. The wicked go astray as soon as they be born. There's sin. It's true. That is the root of the problems with all people, me and you. In sin did my mother conceive me, David declared. That is, from the moment of conception, there was the issue of, of sin within. You might have read the front page of the L.A. Times today, where there on the left-hand column it talks about the Supreme Court veering left, if you would. It talks about the decision handed down by the Supreme Court this week and the 
majority opinion expressed by Justice Anthony Kennedy, who undid the Bowles versus Stedman 1988 decision. That decision was opined by uh, Byron White, Justice White, back then, and that opinion said essentially that homosexuality is a moral problem and it ought to be looked at in that way. Thus, there is a need to outlaw it if states so determine. Well, that was undone this week. And Justice Kennedy, writing for the majority, declared that that decision was a travesty and tragedy in judicial history and that homosexuality is to be looked at in the same way that a man is born left-handed. He ought not to ever be discriminated against or looked down on or dealt with in any way, you see. There ought to be no attempt to adjust, to change, any more than you would change a man who has been born left-handed. But the Bible says it differently. The Bible declares that it's a sin. Like lying is a sin. Like gossip is a sin. Like murder is a sin. The problem is when people say, well, I was born that way. I was born with that orientation, some may say. Well, so, we're all born with some orientation to sin. It might be to murder. You can't chop up people and say, well, that's just kind of the way I'm born. I've got this thing for chainsaws and, you know, I... What, we'd say, sorry, that might be your inclination, but it's not going to be accepted in this nation. See, some people might be born to all sorts of things that are not right. Lying, stealing. People are born with tendencies to sin. They're born into a depraved state. It's true. We don't teach our kids how to lie, how to steal. I never said to Peter, John, or Jesse, or Christy, or Mary, or Ben. Today, kids, we're going to have a lesson in lying. I want to teach you how to lie, you see. I can recall when Peter, John was a little guy, just about, oh, three and a half, almost four. We were in Bymart there, a Kmart kind of store in Medford. It was during the Halloween season. And he was intrigued by the Halloween decorations. And one thing really intrigued him. It was one of these green kind of monster blobby things that bounced up and down on a string. And he really wanted it. And I said, no, Peter John, we don't buy those kinds of things. And so put it back. So he put it back. And again, he tugged on my shirt. Daddy, Daddy, could I get that monster? No, we don't buy those kinds of things, PJ. Okay, okay, he said. And then I went down an aisle, and I noticed that he wasn't with me. So I went back to aisle three, where the green blobby monster was. And he was standing there in aisle three with his hands behind his back, looking at me. And I could tell, man, it was written all over his face. I knew as I made my way in his direction, his eyes got bigger and bigger. He was just sort of frozen there with something behind his back. He saw me coming. And as I came closer and closer, walking ever so slowly, he looked at me. Daddy, 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 stop your legs. Stop your legs. Stop your legs. <laughs> but my legs didn't stop. And I said, Peter, what do you have? We had to deal with that because he had intended, he put it in his back pocket to walk out the store. He told me that's what he was going to do. So I took PJ, he and I went up to the manager's office there and talked to the manager. And Peter sat there and told the manager what he was doing, sticking that thing in his pocket, you see. Oh, my. He's never been the same. <laughs> But you see, every one of us has tendencies to do stuff that isn't right. 
that doesn't mean that it's okay because we have those tendencies innately or we're born that way. No, those things need to be dealt with and rooted out, you see. But in this day, David would say, boy, what's going on? He says, these judges and leaders and politicians, they're weighing in on the side of wickedness and they need to realize that, hey, men are wicked indeed. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. These guys, that's certainly true. Their poison, verse 4, David goes on to say, is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the deaf adder that stoppeth her ear, which will not hearken to the voice of the charmers, no matter how skillfully those charmers do their thing, is the idea. These snakes, David said, who themselves are, are born liars. They won't listen to truth, no matter what song is sung. They close their ears. They hearken not. Oh, break, verse 6, their teeth, O God, in their mouth. Break out the great teeth of the young lions, O Lord. Deal with this evil. Again, I want to remind you that I don't believe this is the way we ought to pray for our politicians or leaders necessarily, <laughs> although it's tempting to sometimes. I don't necessarily believe that's what we ought to do. We, we are told in Ephesians chapter 6, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness, rulers of darkness. We, we wrestle against entities that are, are hellish and demonic, and, and yes, we ought to come against those entities with energy, with vehemency, you might recall there in 2 Kings chapter 13 how in the days of Joash the king, the Syrians were threatening constantly the people of the nation. And there the prophet Elisha said to Joash the king, take those arrows that are in that quiver and smite them against the ground and then shoot an arrow out the window and say, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. And the king took those arrows and tapped him two or three times and shot the arrow out the window. And Elisha looked at Joash and said, you should have smitten the arrows five or six times, but because you only tapped them thrice, you will only have victory partially. What does that mean? Simply this. In the battles that we wage, you know, sometimes I think we pray so lethargically, so, so sleepily, I sometimes sense the Lord is saying to me in my own prayer life, John, stir up your soul. Get engaged. Get involved. Bind the work of the enemy. Pray with expectancy. Even as David here, in the physical, so too we in the spiritual, David says, oh Lord, he says, concerning those guys physically, break their teeth. Lord, just deal with these guys. And so too... We ought to pray for the forces at work that are blinding the eyes of our leaders. Those that are in judicial authority. Those involved in legislation of immorality. We ought to pray, Lord, break, I pray, the powers that seem to blind these men day after day. Lord, bind that work. Break, I pray, those powers. Set these men free from the deception. Liberate them, Lord. And on this 4th of July week, it would be good for us to once again be reminded we need to go to prayer more than ever for this nation. And pray, Lord, open the eyes. Bind the work of the enemy. Uh, let them melt away, verse 7, as waters which run continually. When he bendeth his bow to shoot his arrows, let the arrow be cut as in pieces. As a snail which melteth, let every one of them pass away. I like that. As a snail that melts. You know, as a snail that leaves slime. You know. In fact, speaking of politics and government and all of that, <laughs> in Genesis chapter 11, in that first governmental project where they said let's unite together and we don't need God we'll build our own tower 
We'll solve our own problems. We'll create our own unity. It says this. They said one to another, Go to and let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. So they had brick for stone to build that tower, that tower of Babel. They had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. When I read that, I thought, that describes perfectly the projects of the government. (laughs) Brick, there's some good stuff, but slime seems to hold it together, you see. And here David says, oh, let them be like the snail that melts away the slime they leave behind. Or or better still, when you put salt on a snail. (laughs) We used to have tons of slugs in our backyard up in Oregon. You know, it just was always a problem. And I used to get the salt shaker regularly. I could have been arrested for assault, I know, but I would go out there and those slugs would just bubble up and that's the idea. David says, as a snail which melts, let every one of them pass away like the untimely birth of a woman, a woman who is miscarrying. May they not see the sun. Before your pots can feel the thorns, He shall take them away as with a whirlwind, both living and in his wrath. That is, speaking of camping, cooking, as the thorns are are burning, providing fuel for the fire as the pot is cooking. You're outside, you're eating, and the thorns are providing the kindling or the fire. But then comes a whirlwind, a storm, and your meal is lost as you're eating outside. That's the idea, O Lord. Cause these that are evil, propagating evil, working evil, governmentally, judicially, cause them, Lord, to melt like the snail, cause cause what they're cooking up to be blown away like a whirlwind at a campfire, you see. And the righteous, verse 10, shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked, so that a man shall say, verily, there is a reward for the righteous. Verily, He is a God that judges the earth. If it is right for God to destroy, it cannot be wrong for his servants to rejoice in what he does. So we're going to see that day when the Lord, he would say, vengeance is mine, and he will deal with those issues. We are to love people, and we are to pray passionately against the forces that are blinding and deceiving Yes, but the Lord will come one day and judge righteously and rule with a rod of iron. And when he does, indeed, we will rejoice. Psalm 59, this was written earlier after Saul had thrown spears at David when David was in Saul's court playing the harp, ministering to Saul, but Saul was firing at David time and again. After three times, David realized Saul is out to get me, and I need to get out of here, you see. So he ran away. Well, Saul sent men to watch David's house. David was married to Michael, Saul's daughter, and Michael helped David escape that night by letting David down in a basket. And then they put some pillows in David's bed in such a way that if the men looked in, they would see a figure in David's bed, thinking it was David, but no, it wasn't David at all. It was just a bunch of pillows. Well, this was written in that situation, as the notation in Psalm 59 says, when Saul sent and they watched the house to kill David. Deliver me from mine enemies, O God. Defend me from them that rise up against me. Deliver me from the workers of iniquity. Save me from bloody men. For lo, they lie in wait for my soul. The mighty are gathered against me. Not for my transgression, nor for my sin, O Lord. They run and prepare themselves without my fault. Awake to help me, and behold. Verse 5, Thou therefore, O Lord, God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to visit all the heathen. Be not merciful to any wicked transgressors. They return at evening. Verse 6, They make a noise like a dog, and go round about the city. Behold, they belch out with their mouth. Swords are in their lips. For who, say they, doth hear? But thou, O Lord, shalt laugh at them. 
Thou shalt have all the heathen in derision. Because of his strength will I wait upon thee. For God is my defense. Verse 10, the God of my mercy shall prevent or go before me. God shall let me see my desire upon my enemies. Slay them not, lest my people forget. Scatter them by thy power. Bring them down, O Lord, our shield. For the sin of their mouth and the words of their lips, let them even be taken in their pride. And for their cursing and lying which they speak, consume them in wrath. Consume them that they may not be. And let them know that God ruleth in Jacob unto the ends of the earth. Verse 14. And at evening let them return. Let them make noise like a dog. And go round about the city. Let them wander up and down for meat or scavenging for food. And grudge if they be not satisfied or stay awake all night if they are not satisfied. Here David likens these that are watching his house that night, waiting to devour him if they could. He likens them to dogs. Interesting. Dogs. I can recall in Jacksonville a few years ago where I used to live. I was going for an early morning walk, and this Doberman Pinscher comes running out after me. And man, he is just, you know, barking, and he's coming in my direction, and so I, I, I start running. And uh, <laughs> he's chasing me down the street, this little side street I was walking on. So I realize i got to really move, and so, so I kick off my flip-flops that I was wearing and start really, really running. And he's catching up, and all of a sudden, I just turn around and yeah, yell at him like that. And he backed away a bit, and, and, and he made his way back to where he came from. And uh, I walked a little bit further, and I saw one of our, our police guys, our police officers. And I said, you know, there's a Doberman. Uh, he's loose, and man kind of scary. Go get him. So the police guy went and picked up this Doberman, put him in his car, and they drove by me, the police and the Doberman pincher. And they drove right by, and I tell you the truth, dogs, it's amazing. They have this ability to smile. <laughs> and this, do this dog was just grinning at me. Just smiling, you know, from ear to ear. Just big as life. And I thought, what does he know? And, 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 and the, the cop, you know, stopped the car, rolled down the window, said, hey, hey, uh, Pastor John. I said, yeah. He said, this, this dog. I said, yeah, take him to the pound, man. Get rid of this guy. And no, he, he's the mayor's dog. <laughs> he was the mayor of Jacksonville's dog, so he gets this private escort back in the police car. Dog's just smiling at me, you see. <laughs> Oh, man. My. David says, these guys that are surrounding my house, they make a noise like a dog, verse 6 says. And again, verse 14, he feels like these guys are salivating and, and, and these guys with their fangs they're bearing, waiting to rip into me. We have dogs around us, too, watching. Who? Interesting, because the Apostle Paul uses this analogy in Philippians chapter 3. When Paul the Apostle says, beware of dogs, beware of the concision. Huh? The concision. Legalizers that went from place to place where Paul had been preaching grace and saying, no, it's not that easy, it's not that simple. If you're really serious about following after God, you've got to keep these rules and those regulations and do these acts and other things, you see, dealing with circumcision. And they were seeking to make these new Christians that were converted by the gospel of Jesus Christ that Paul preached so persuasively. These, these guys were making these new believers fearful, miserable, wanting to inflict their pain, the concision, the circumcisers, on these Christians that were so thrilled to be saved and born again. Paul says they're dogs. They're dogs. 
Those that want to suck you in or pull you back into religiosity, legalism, rules and regulations to take you away from the grace, the grace, the grace, the grace that saved you when you opened up your heart to Him that day. Paul would say, even as you have received Christ, so walk ye in Him. How did you receive Jesus? You simply said, I'm a sinner, I need a Savior. You opened up your heart to Him. You were born again. Grace, grace. It's not the starting point. It's the only point. Grace. When you realize it's God's riches at Christ's expense. It's unmerited, undeserved, unearned favor. Grace. It makes you love God with all of your heart and appreciate Him so much. You lose interest in sin. You don't want to do that stuff like you used to because, man, you're born again. There's a better way. You realize the Lord wants what's best for you. So you hear what He has to say in His Word, but you don't get involved again in legalism, external rules, and man's religiosities and regulations. Paul said they're dogs. Philippians chapter 3, beware of dogs, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit. This is the true, true, true circumcision. Those that really have been free from the flesh, you see, we worship God in the Spirit. We rejoice in Christ Jesus and we have no confidence in the flesh. I like that. We worship God in the Spirit. Rejoice in Christ, what He's done for us. And we have no confidence in our flesh that we can be a religious people or we can do anything in our own energy. We just look to the Lord and say, Lord, have your way. Change me. Come in. Take control of me. And I thank you, Lord, that you're in my heart, that you're guiding my steps, that you are my Lord. Watch out. For those that want to seek their fangs into you. David said, oh Lord, Lord, I'm surrounded by these men. Lord, protect me. And the Lord did. I will sing, verse 16, of thy power. Yea, I will sing aloud of thy mercy in the morning. For thou hast been my defense and refuge in the day of my trouble. Oh, unto thee, O oh, my strength, will I sing. For God is my defense and the God of my mercy. Hey, when people want to point their finger at me and come down on me, make their accusations against me, let me tell you something. God is my defense. He is the God of mercy. He's yours too. And that's a grand truth. He defends us with the blood of His Son. He shows us mercy, each and every one, morning by morning. Ah. Quickly, in three minutes, we'll be done. Psalm 60. (laughs) Psalm 60. King David was at war against the Syrians up north, to the northeast. He launched a preemptive attack against the Syrians. But while he was doing that, down south, the soldiers of Edom attacked Judah, or the southern part of Israel, the tribe of Judah, and made their way to Jerusalem too. While David was up north fighting against the Syrians preemptively, launching this war against the Syrians, their enemy, down south, the Edomites made their move. This troubled David greatly. For you see, David in this situation, there's no record of him being directed by the Lord in this battle. He just saw a need. He thought, well, this is what I should do. And now he hears a report, David, There's an attack down south. The people of Edom, the Edomites, are attacking and conquering Judah and Jerusalem too. Oh God, he says, thou hast cast us off, thou hast scattered us, thou hast been displeased. Oh, turn thyself to us again. Thou hast made the earth to tremble, thou hast broken it, heal the breaches thereof, for it shaketh. Some commentators believe there was an earthquake at this time, verse 2, that David is alluding to. More than likely, it's not an earthquake, but David and those around him are just all shook up, quite frankly. They're shook up indeed with reports that Jerusalem has been attacked and fallen to the Edomites. Oh, thou showed, verse 3, thy people hard things. Thou hast made us to drink the wine of astonishment. This is hard. 
It's a bitter pill to swallow, is what David is saying. Thou hast given a banner, a flag, verse 4, to them that fear thee, that it might be displayed because of thy truth. Oh, Jehovah Nissi, the Lord, our banner, and his banner over us is love. We're flying your flag, Lord. Don't allow this to happen. Jerusalem to be conquered, Judah to be destroyed. Lord, we're flying your flag, you see. Oh, verse 5, that thy beloved may be delivered. Save with thy right hand. Hear me. God hath spoken, verse 6, in his holiness. And now God's speaking. I will rejoice. I will divide Shechem and meet out the valley of Sukkoth. Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim also is the strength of mine head. Judah is my lawgiver. All areas that related to the people of Israel, to the Jews. I've given you these territories. I've given you this heritage. Judah is my lawgiver, you see. It's mine. I'm in control. Also, verse 8, Moab, one of the perpetual enemies of Israel, is my wash pot. Or they're washed up, you see. Over Edom will I cast out my shoe, like when you get a pebble or a rock in your shoe, you just kind of shake it out and empty it out. The Lord here says, Moab is my wash pot. Edom, I'll shake out my shoe. Philistia, the Philistines, triumph thou because of me. Or literally, I will shout triumph over thee. Moab, Edom, Philistia, God declares, you're washed up. I'm going to shake you out. I'm going to shout triumph over you and throughout your land too. Who, David now says, David back again in verse 9, Who will bring me into the strong city? Who will lead me into Edom? The strong city is Petra, the rock city where the Edomites had their capital, you see. Who's going to take me there? Who's going to lead me there? David, you see, had dispatched Joab, his general, from up north to go down south to engage the Edomites in battle. But David himself desires to go. And David, at this time, you see, is asking for God's help and guidance and strength. He didn't the first time, but he's learned his lesson. Verse 10, Wilt not thou, O God, which had cast us off, and thou, O God, which didst not go out with our armies? O God, lead me now. Guide me. Give us help, verse 11, from trouble, for vain is the help of man. I've dispatched Joab, David would say it's true, but I've learned a lesson in this preemptive strike against the Syrians, I need to be directed by you. Oh Lord, I need you. Give us help. And through you, verse 12, through God we shall do valiantly. For he it is that shall tread down our enemies. Lord, I'm looking to you, and I know that we are going to have victory through you as we're directed by you, as we do what you want us to do. One last story, we're done. I was talking to a couple, close friends. They have a high school junior. And this high school junior was told by mom and dad, you're at the place now where where you need to make decisions about what you do. So camp is coming up, and uh, it's, it's, it's your choice. Well, this high school junior, he decided that he wasn't going to go to camp. And so he said, Mom, Dad, I, I, I've decided I'm not going to go to camp. I'm going to do some other stuff that week. It just doesn't work out. And Dad looked at that son and said, No, you are going to camp. <laughs> and the kid said, Dad, I, I, thought, I thought you said I could make my decisions. His dad said, You can, if they're the right ones. <laughs> and I like that. That's great. You can, if they're the right ones. And David here is now learning, Lord, I made my decision, launched that battle. It proved to be a disaster ultimately until I sought you and you had mercy and you gave us victory. Lord, I need to look to you for everything I do. Help me not to presume or assume, but help me to say, like David did finally in his day, Lord, we're looking to you. Guide and direct us and watch and see that you too, like David, we will do valiantly through our Lord, 
for his glory. Let's pray, shall we? Now, Father, as we come to this part of our study together, I would pray that, Lord, whatever dogs might be barking, causing us to feel inadequate or condemned, causing us to feel as though, Lord, there are things that we should do religiously, but not not the things, Lord, that your Spirit would have us do actually. Set us free. Cause us to rest in your mercy, to rejoice in your grace, to be led by your Spirit. Father, may this group, may we as a, as a group of sisters and brothers be free to praise your name day by day for your grace and your kindness and your mercy. May we seek your face, Lord. May we trust in you and not be upset when souls come our way. Cause me, Lord, help us to be a people that forgive freely, express grace, extend mercy. Work these things into us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Thank you for hearing this prayer and what you'll do because we trust in you to work your word in us and through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.